Joan Didion, the year of magical thinking, signed at Book Soup in Los Angeles, long ago. Films are often made from books, and one of Joan and John's film scripts was based on one of her books. Perhaps I'm even forgetting another one. But when a book turns into a play, that's very seldom. And this particular time came when David Hare convinced Scott Rudin, a tremendously good theatre producer, to finance a workshop in 2006, March 2006. And Joan and David Hare chose an actress, Linda Amond. Perhaps you're here today, Linda, I don't know. And then, in March, we opened at the booth. Maybe that's when we had our first preview, three weeks of previews. And then, we opened at the booth. And then, a year later, we did a little United Kingdom tour. And then we opened at the National Theatre in May 2008. And that's something that meant the world to Joan. Because John and Quintana had died. Joan was sitting in the wings or in the rehearsal room for every performance of the year of magical thinking. Every one. She'd have a little table and a little electric candle and either the stage management or one of Joan's assistants would bring in her supper and she would have it at the table, little round cafe table with a little cafe chair in what we call in the theater, the wings. It's a nice word, isn't it? The wings. And there's that rose window which is also there in the book. I'm going to read to you now the very last page. Two and a half pages. From the book and from the play. I think you'll have gathered what David Hare gave to Joan and Scott Rudin. The only kind of happiness that could fill her again after the death of John and Quintana. I realize as I write this that I do not want to finish this account, nor did I want to finish the year. The craziness is receding, but no clarity is taking its place. I look for resolution and find none. I did not want to finish the year because I know 
that as the days pass, as January becomes February and February becomes summer, certain things will happen. My image of John at the instant of his death will become less immediate, less raw. It will become something that happened in another year. My sense of John himself, John alive, will become more remote, even mudgy, softened, transmuted into whatever best serves my life without him. In fact, this is already beginning to happen. All year I've been keeping time for last year's calendar, what we were doing on this day last year. Where did we have dinner? Is it the day a year ago we flew to Honolulu after Quintana's wedding? Is it the day a year ago we flew back from Paris? Is it the day I realized today for the first time that my memory of this day a year ago is a memory that does not involve John. This day a year ago was December the 31st, 2003. John did not see this day a year ago. John was dead. I was crossing Lexington Avenue when this occurred to me. I know why we try to keep the dead alive. We try to keep them alive in order to keep them with us. I also know that if we are to live ourselves, there comes a point at which we must relinquish the dead let them go, keep them dead, let them become the photograph on the table, let them become the name on the trust accounts, let go of them in the water. In fact, the apprehension that our life together will increasingly be the center of my every day, seemed today on Lexington Avenue, so distinct a betrayal that I lost all sense of oncoming traffic. I think about leaving the lay at St. John the Divine, a souvenir of the Christmas in Honolulu when we filled the screen with blue. During the years when people still left Honolulu on the mats and lines, the custom at the moment of departure was to throw lays on the water, a promise that the traveler would return. The lays would get caught in the wake and go bruised and brown, the way the gardenias in the pool filter at the house in Brentwood Park had gone bruised and brown. The other morning when I woke, I tried to remember the arrangement of the rooms in the house in Brentwood Park. I imagined myself walking through the rooms, first on the ground floor, then on the second, Later in the day, I realized I'd forgotten one. The lay I left at St. John the Divine would have gone brown by now. Lays go brown. Tectonic plates shift. Deep currents move. 
islands vanish. Rooms get forgotten. I flew into Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore with John in 1979 and 1980. Some of the islands that were there then would now be gone, just shallows. I think about swimming with him into the cave at Portuguese Bends, about the swell of clear water, the way it changed, the swiftness and power it gained as it narrowed through the rocks at the base of the point. The tide had to be just right. We had to be in the water at the very moment the tide was right. We could only have done this a half dozen times at most during the two years we lived there, but it is what I remember. Each time we did it, I was afraid of missing the swell, hanging back, timing it wrong. John never was. You had to feel the swell change. He had to go with the change. He told me that. No eye is on the sparrow, but he did tell me that.